Educational textbooks, whether Western or heavily influenced by the Eurocentric version of history, will have you believe that there exists a vacuum in the evolution of civilizations. A virtual suspension on advancements in terms of philosophy, history, mathematics, medicine, economics, as well as other sciences from era A, that of ancient Greece and Rome, to era B, the scientific revolution and its immediate successor, the Age of Enlightenment. These same textbooks insist that no in-between moments of progress took place, as if the world stopped in its passions for exploration and discovery, waiting for the West to recapture its grip on civility, to then lead the rest of the world out of total darkness. This is the myth of Western domination when it comes to the discovery and advancements of the sciences throughout history. And if we visualize such a narrative, having the scholars, thinkers, and polymaths of ancient Greece and Rome on one side, while the academic scientists and intellectuals of the early modern period on the other, we see a huge gap of history, almost two millennia long. And if we draw out these connections between the two eras, we can select Thucydides as an example from era A, where the resultant inspired intellectual from era B would be Niccolo Machiavelli. Another one, Herodotus, we get Montague. Aristotle, Adam Smith pops out. Epicurus on one end, Karl Marx on the other. Plato, Giambattista Vico reveals himself. We can keep on going with these threads connecting the two ages in history of scientific advancement, but I ask, did nothing scientifically worthwhile happen along these two millennia to assist in facilitating the eventual conclusions and theories? Of course, many substantial civilizations ebbed and flowed during these times all the way from the far east of Asia to its extreme west. One key era was the Golden Age of Islam, in all of its ups and downs. And if I were to introduce this filter and the many scholars and thinkers within Islam's version of the Age of Enlightenment onto the previous lines drawn connecting the two eras, and at the precipice of this vital civilization, that we find the crossroads and lineage of many of the ideas and theories that were triggered in what I refer to as Era A, Ancient Greece and Rome, and that were then formalized as proven theorems or principles during era B, the early modern era. And the ones I specifically highlighted all consolidate to one polymath, and that's Ibn Khaldun. Take that in for a second. Again, I'm not saying the world owes it to Ibn Khaldun for the principles, discoveries, or theories of those mentioned in era B, but I'm stating that without Ibn Khaldun, many of these conclusions will at the very least be different to what they are today, definitely less articulated and evolved. Other early modern era scholars also owe credit to Ibn Khaldun for his undeniably powerful writings. These would include Voltaire, David Hume, Hegel, August Conte, David Ricardo, and Emile Durkheim. Abu Zaid Abdul Rahman Ibn Khaldun had a very troubled life. Troubled not due to his own ebbs and flows of life, but due to the circumstances of the Islamic empire, or let me be more elaborate, smaller empires during his lifetime in the 14th and 15th century. He had basically witnessed the dissolution of the Islamic empire into smaller powers that eventually got gobbled up by the Ottoman empire. Such an experience would have a palpable impact on his psyche, and fortunately for us, on the works that he would eventually generate. Beyond his political, judicial, and teaching careers, Ibn Khaldun would go on to produce several noteworthy works. His first was Lubab al-Muhassil, that provided commentaries on Islamic theology. Next was Shifa al-Sa'il li Tahdib al-Masa'il, or A Remedy for the Questioner in Search of Answers, was a book on the practice of Sufism. And then there was his autobiography, At-Ta'rif bi Ibn Khaldun wa rihlatahu sharqan wa gharban, Discovering Ibn Khaldun and his journey to the East and West. And finally, his landmark writing, Kitab al-Ibar wa Diwan al-Mubtada wa al-Khabar, or in English, The Book of Lessons and Record of Beginnings and Accounts, a seven-volume catalog dealing with the universal history of the civilized world up until the end of the 14th century. But what is most famous of the Kitab al-Ibar was its first book, The Introduction, better known as Al-Muqaddimah, and it's this first volume that provides us with the real insights and concepts that Ibn Khaldun dealt with in the analysis, composition, and writing of this opus. 
and it is also from this volume that Ibn Khaldun gains many of his epithets. The father of the social sciences, of historiography, sociology, economics, and demographics. Let's take a quick look at some of these sciences and how Ibn Khaldun introduced a new way of thinking about them. History for eons before Ibn Khaldun was a simpler practice of the recording and recollection of events in antiquity. Ibn Khaldun widened the prism exponentially. Historians, famous ones like Herodotus and Plutarch and beyond, had documented military events and the lives and biographies of leaders of nations and empires. For Ibn Khaldun, history involved much, much more. History for him was a science. It had to be viewed with a complex lens capturing all of history's social phenomena, the environment of the zeitgeist and how it would greatly influence the way in which history would take place and how eventually it should have been written for it to be understood. And how Ibn Khaldun recognized that historians in antiquity were more focused on praising leadership with compliments than with depicting accurately what, how, and why events unfolded. Ibn Khaldun's internal thoughts could almost reflect Winston Churchill's future principle of history is written by the victors. One key observation of Ibn Khaldun, and one of my own personal favorites, is his theory on cycles of power in history, and how one could assess the state and the life cycle of an empire or power depending on certain key factors, moral and ethical decay, and the collapse of the oneness of a people. A certain fatalism seemed to be a recurrent theme once a level of decay took over a certain empire slowly diminishing it into a shadow of itself, only for another power to rise up in the same way and take control, and the vicious cycle strikes again. This trend, Ibn Khaldun concluded, wasn't only found on a level of nations, but was also present in the cycle of power of people and families throughout history, and how dynasties have a natural lifespan like individuals, and that no dynasty generally lasts beyond three generations of about 40 years each, Further enforcing the Chinese proverb, the grandfather builds the empire, the father squanders the empire, and the son loses the empire. I'm not quite sure who came up with that one first, Ibn Khaldun or the Chinese intellectuals. Being given the title of the father of sociology is no small matter. The impact one would have to have in order for such an honor must have been beyond substantial. But from a personal perspective, the element of sociology that I find most intriguing and critical for the understanding of human nature, both throughout history and in its current era, is Ibn Khaldun's explanations and expansions on the concept of Asabiyya. There are many more names or definitions for Asabiyya. Some come with baggage, as in the case of tribalism. But other versions exist like social solidarity, group consciousness, and even the French version esprit de corps, a spirit or force unifying humans. As per Ibn Khaldun, on the shoulders of Asabiyya came the formation of societies, and then onwards to nations, and then empires. It's at its most powerful at the beginnings of any success story, victory, and prosperity. And as the lifespan of one success story progressed, cracks in its Asabiyya start to show, till the Asabiyya of a peripheral people begins its journey into ascendance and again begins to dominate its region. A beautiful observation for me is how Ibn Khaldun noted the Hasabiyya is at its strongest during the nomadic phase of human progress, when there was no infiltration or dilution of the togetherness of the tribe, and how Hasabiyya decreases as civilizations advance and consequently begin to dissolve into smaller factionalism and individualism and ultimately collapse. I don't know why, but when I think of Ibn Khaldun and economics, a title for him always pops into my mind. The proto-capitalist. Obviously, he was way ahead of any other father of economics coming into being, as in the Adam Smiths of the world who arrived on the scene some four centuries later. But the more I think about this title, the more I believe it would be diminishing to Ibn Khaldun's true value and legacy to economics. His theories and systems reach much further than a single economic system. It is a universal system fundamental to all economic systems. At its most basic, his theories recognize that civilization and its well-being 
as well as business prosperity, depended on productivity and people's efforts in all directions in their own interest and profit. And Ibn Khaldun recognized that to implement such an ideal economic system, certain prerequisites had to be set in place. A legal system, governance, ownership, society, and free and fair trade. For Ibn Khaldun, these necessities underlined how an economy could function and prosper for its civilization. In recognizing the role of production and labor and how specialization of the labor force was a necessary development for quantity, quality, and cost efficiency. In the importance of value and money and how such value must be objective and guaranteed and accepted by all legal tender in order to achieve economic affluence. In the necessary part that government had to play in making money, taxation, and in spending it as in infrastructure. And these notions seem commonplace to us today, all basic economics. Yet, it's the 14th century when this foundational set of principles were put in place. Yet the West gives tremendous value to the same ideas to those who came after Ibn Khaldun. Enter again Mr. Adam Smith, whose book The Wealth of Nations and its ideas are identical to those of the Muslim polymath. As I said from the outset, Ibn Khaldun didn't come up with all of this by himself, but he did in fact come up with a substantial amount. Just to look at one of the sciences he provided so much on, history, Ibn Khaldun began the process of us looking back at our history with a much more empathetic eye and mind. We could start to understand what people were thinking and why they were thinking that way. With his version of recording and telling history, we recognize the challenges that confronted the societies of antiquity, the behavioral shifts, political dynamics, and socio-economic conditions that resulted in both major salvations and catastrophes. History changed forever. Those we were reading about through Ibn Khaldun's lens became living beings with their own set of successes and failures, as opposed to personas who were etchings or carvings set in stone that seemed to be suspended in time. The inanimate came to life, and history became that much more exciting and intriguing. Why? Because history, after Ibn Khaldun, became much, much more human. Now just imagine how he comprehensively changed how we view all the other sciences.